a big welcome um, to all of you here this evening for the opening session of Revolution, Counterfire's annual festival of Marxist ideas. My name is Holly Rigby. I'm a teacher, activist and writer, and I'm going to be uh, chairing the session tonight. Uh, this is our opening session of the festival and we've got a brilliant programme of speakers and sessions lined up for you this weekend. Uh, so everything, uh, the other sessions we kick off tomorrow um, in, uh, with speakers including Jeremy Corbyn, Loki, Andrew Murray, um, Daniel Bono and many more. And uh, wow, what a weekend to be doing this festival after the events of the last week. Uh, not only the, the huge um, TUC demonstration in London last weekend, uh, but also the incredibly inspiring um, uh, strike by RMT workers, but also the seemingly extraordinary support that they have gathered um, within wider society. And I think this has really kicked off what seems to be uh, a 2022 a year that is going to be full of struggle against this corrupt government um, and also their cronies. Um, and I think in many ways, this is the explosion of um, anger and frustration in the streets um, and in the workplaces that we're seeing that has been pent up really from the COVID crisis and is now finding its expression in struggle. Uh, and I don't know about all of you, but it's been very, very inspiring um, week to be um, both observing and being part of um, these uh, activist struggles that are emerging. So we're going to be talking about all of this this weekend. Um, it's always important to talk about Marxist ideas and practice, but it feels incredibly urgent um, given the escalation and struggle that's now happening. Um, so if you haven't done so already, please do sign up for the rest of the festival, which is taking place tomorrow. Uh, I think someone will um, kindly put a link in the chat for that. Uh, we'd love to see you at some of those other sessions. Uh, so tonight we're opening with a really important discussion on uh, NATO, Ukraine and the New World Disorder. And we're going to be talking about um, both the theory and practice of what it means to be an anti-imperialist against both East and West across the global left today. We have a brilliant lineup of speakers tonight. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this and I'm, I'm going to uh, introduce them one by one rather than introducing them all at the beginning. Um, the speakers are gonna have about seven minutes to speak uh, and then we're gonna open the floor for um, contributions and for questions. And I'm sure we will have a lively discussion as always. Um, the chat isn't gonna be open this evening, um, but if you would like to send a question, a written question, you can send one to me directly. Uh, but when it comes to the discussion, we'll give people the opportunity to unmute and um, offer their contribution or uh, their question for any of our speakers. Um, so we're going to start this evening uh, with our first speaker, um, who is Alex Kenny. And Alex Kenny is an active member of the National Education Union uh, and on the National Executive, part of my union as well as a teacher. Um, very exciting to hear that we will be um, shortly soon uh, balloting for strike action in the wave of this uh, uh, part of this wave of struggle that's emerging. Um, and Alex is also a supporter of um, Counterfire. So Alex, uh, you are going to be introducing us this evening. Thank you very much, Holly. And thanks for the invitation to speak. I'm uh, very pleased to be a supporter of Counterfire, uh, which I think is playing a, a very vital role um, in the movement and has been doing so for uh, for a number of years. Um, I, I'm going to talk about the debate inside trade unions uh, on Ukraine um, and how the, the stop the war positions being debated and, and how that's gone and, and how that's going. But I, I want to start because I, I think it's useful to start with where where the class is at in a way with with what uh, what Holly started with, because um, I, I think the last week has been the best week for our movement for, for many years, for the reasons uh, Holly said so. And, and what we've seen is a real sharp increase in interest in trade unions and what they do and what they talk about. Um, there was a figure from the TUC last week that uh, if you put in the, the, the words trade union, what do trade unions do, um, had a 184% increase you know, in searches for trade unions. My union and other unions, including the RMT, are reporting uh, a big uptick in membership uh, recruitment as we've gone on the front foot and started to talk about class politics and system change. And I think that's, you know, that's a reflection of what's happened in the week, that people are 
talking about class politics and system change. And I think one really important aspect of that is that we, we have seen in Mick Lynch and Eddie Dempsey and other RMT people, working class trade unions, able to articulate uh, a clear understanding of class politics and be really unbending be really unbending uh, in, in doing so, you know, a model for, for, for Labour politicians. And you can see the reaction from some, and I, I don't think we should lionise uh, individuals, but the way they've done it, I think, has been very good and created a space. But you can see a really patronising attitude, I think, from some towards Mick Lynch and others. Who would have thought working class people could talk about politics, could talk about class in such a clear way uh, and, and be able to... Uh, defend their position and I, I think that explains some of the reaction to him uh, we, we shouldn't be surprised and, and we're not surprised uh, by that um, so I think there is and there will be and Countify is in a really good position to um, uh, to, to grow fr from this a, a real interest in class politics developing over the next uh, over the next period because I think people can see that the current system is broken that it's not working uh, and, and they will be looking for ideas, the ideas that you're going to be talking about uh, over this weekend. And, and I think the same goes, th this will go for the questions of war uh, as well, not just on what's happening in the economy, how you fix a, a broken economy, because as people start develop their interest in unions, they'll be interested in what unions talk about, uh, and, and they will be ready, I think, to, and we should be ready to come back to the questions of war in, uh, in Ukraine and uh, imperialism in, inside trade unions. Because one of the things we've said from the start uh, in, in our position on the war is, is in Ukraine, is that it's working people on whichever side of the border they're on, whether they're in Russia, whether they're in Ukraine, it's working people who are the losers uh, in any war. And we shouldn't forget in this that the RMT took a very good position on the war in, in, in Ukraine right from the start, a position similar to, to the stop the war position, which I think was the, the principal position. They had a very good position on it, a class position that you know understood that working people had nothing to gain from the prosecution of war uh, and our, you know, the way our government uh, uh, was responding to it. And I think it was right, therefore, that Stop the War had a presence uh, on the demonstration last week. And with the slogan, I, I think it was cut welfare, not uh, cut warfare, not welfare or warfare, not welfare, welfare, not warfare. Sorry, I'm getting the wrong way around. Um, but I think it was right that that, that that was put into the mix in 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 the um in the demonstration last week that it, it wasn't and, and we should be clear that we shouldn't just be relying on in industrial militancy on economic questions we should be returning to militancy on on questions of war uh, and imperialism so so the cut warfare not welfare is a simple slogan but i think it's one that people will rally to as the economic crisis deepens and this government tries to uh, you know make make us uh, pay for it so I'll, I'll go on now to talk about the, the debate inside my union, which I think mirrors the debate inside other unions. Uh, and I think it's quite instructive when, you know, when thinking about and has been instructive for us when, when thinking about how people are responding to, uh, to the war in Ukraine. Uh, so we put in the NEU, we had our conference at Easter and the left counter fire supporters and uh, on, uh, others on the left uh, put a very simple um, motion to conference which articulated uh, the basic stop the war position that uh, we were opposed to the invasion we wanted Russian troops out in favor of a negotiated peace we wanted no UK or NATO troops on the ground in Ukraine uh, and no expansion of uh, military alliances and articulated this position about working people being the losers and we had we we'd already debated it in our exec and won that position on our executive, then took it to conference. And we had a really sober debate uh, where people really wanted to listen and gave it a lot of time uh, to listen uh, and, and debate it through. Uh, and of course, this was at a time when the war was still almost daily on our TV screens. It was really interesting, wasn't it, that we were seeing the war from the, the end through the TV 
media outlets, we were seeing it from the people on the receiving end, which we hadn't seen in Iraq and we hadn't seen in Afghanistan. So people had a very visceral reaction to what they were seeing and wanted it to end and were looking for ways, you know, looking for solutions. And in a way, that that was uh, what we were debating. Um, we then faced an... Oh, an, an left, Alex. Sorry? A minute left. Oh, God, really? <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. So we we then debated an amendment which took all those bits out of it, uh, which we defeated uh, after some really good debate. But then when it came back to voting on what was our original motion, we lost the vote because I think people just got a little bit scared and were persuaded by emotional arguments from people who had relatives in Ukraine. And then the most disgraceful contribution saying, well, actually, not all wars end in peace because Japan didn't end in negotiated peace. So invoking the spit of Hiroshima to uh, defeat a motion that was calling for negotiated peace. Um, so my final points, um, we were told at the outset, weren't we, when this started, that Russia was losing. Everyone was telling us Russia was losing this war and that the more aid we gave to Ukraine would bring it to a quick end. That hasn't happened, has it? And, and now no longer people are no longer talking about uh, R Russia losing. But it's clear that NATO, I think, over the months, and I think people are beginning to see this, that NATO is stopping the peace, that NATO is telling Ukraine not to sue for peace and, and uh, to, to keep going, you know, till every last bit of uh, Ukrainian blood is is spilt. Um, the, the final point then, uh, two points I'll make, is, is that Stop the War, I think, has held a principled position. It's the only organisation that took a principled position in this that I know everyone here supported. And we've held our nerve. And I think we're being proved right. I think we're being proved right. And if we come back to this, and we can start to come back to this in trade unions, more people will understand why we took the position. And it hasn't been easy in Stop the War. There have been arguments in Stop the War about what we say about Russia. But I think those of us who took and supported the original position have held our nerve and continue to do so. And then I just want to end by saying that the ruling class always use war to create peace at home and dampen down uh, industrial militancy. And that's why we have to support the RMT uh, if they continue to take strike action and we come back to an escalation of war uh, in Ukraine. If you remember the FBU strike in 2002, they were accused of undermining British troops in, in Afghanistan. So there will be attempts to, to try and play one against the other. And, and we have to be, um, uh, you know, we have to be clear on this, that, that we are not going to um, pull back, you know, in, in their interests uh, for pursuing the war uh, in Ukraine. And then finally, Stop the War has got a trade union conference, I think, set for the autumn. It's really important that those of us who are in trade unions support that, go back to passing motions in branches uh, and make that a really good conference where we can place uh, trade unions, uh, you know, more, get them to play a more central role in the anti-war and anti-imperialist movement. Um, so there, sorry, I went on a bit too long. No, thank you so much, Alex. And uh, were we in real life, um, you would um, hear a, a large round of applause <laughs> for you at this at this moment. And yeah, thank you so much for drawing together the um, trade union struggles with our anti-imperialist um, struggles, which I think is so important. And you're absolutely right. I th think we're seeing those things come together in these movements in the last week without question. Um, okay, so next, our next speaker is Phyllis Bennis. Um, Phyllis is a fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington and of the Amsterdam-based Transnational Institute. She writes and speaks widely across the US and throughout the world on US foreign policy and militarism. Her books include Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, A Primer and Challenging Empire, How People, Governments and the UN Defy US Power. Uh, so Phyllis, you are also going to have seven minutes to speak. Um, I think you're, you're there. Well, thanks very much. And thanks to everybody at Counterfire, everybody who's listening. Um, you know, those of us here in the US are <clears throat> in mourning today for the loss of our rights, the consolidation of a serious right wing trend in this country moving us towards the dark ages. So it's very good to be with you all talking about revolution instead. Uh, so thank you for that. I would start with something that we just heard about how every war impacts poor and working people 
massively disproportionately than anything else. And that's why our focus in, in building the anti-militarist movement, anti-imperialist movement in the US focuses very sharply on cutting the military budget, the, the bloated military budget of over $800 billion, nearly a trillion dollars, an unfathomable number, uh, which of course is more than the next 10 uh, countries combined, including the big spenders, including China, et cetera. And the reason for cutting the military budget, of course, is twofold. One, to bring that money home to pay for the needs of working people across the country, poor and working people constitute 140 million people who are either poor, directly poor, under the poverty level in the United States, or are just one $400 accident away from being in that category. Uh, and the second reason to stop the killing around the rest of the world. And both of those things are important. So clearly there are differences in terms of how this war, the war in Ukraine is being viewed in the United States, different from US led wars, explicitly US led wars, the global war on terror of the last 20 years in particular, and with very different positions from the media, from various other ruling class forces. For progressives and for the left and for Marxists, uh, it's always easier to understand and especially easier to oppose wars when they are led explicitly and directly by US imperialism and are being clearly and officially fought in the interests of US imperialism. In Ukraine, it's a little more complicated. There's no question that the US and NATO have provoked Russia for decades. The provocation has escalated in recent years. The provocation has been continuous. But it's also true that Russia's response to that provocation was not at all inevitable. Russia did not have to go to war in response to US and NATO provocations over the, over the years. I think a good way for us to be thinking about this is something that was articulated recently by Richard Falk. Uh, who talked about there being two wars being fought simultaneously in the Ukraine. One is the ground war in which Russia is actually the aggressor of this war. The other is a geopolitical war that has much longer roots in which the United States is the aggressor. Both of them, of course, are willing to fight to the last Ukrainian. And I think it's important for us to realize that acknowledging Russia as a I mean, we, there's all kinds of categories we could use, neoliberal, repressive, reactionary, militaristic, all kinds of terrible versions of capitalism, that recognizing that, treating Russia as that, does not by any means equal saying that US imperialism is over, or US imperialism is okay, or US imperialism is a lesser danger, or anything like that. We have to keep both of those realities in mind, and that's a bit of a challenge, I think. Now, given that we have very small amount of time, I'm gonna skip over the whole history of the US NATO provocations against Russia. I have a feeling you're all pretty familiar with that part. So I'm gonna leave that behind and come back to this notion of the, the two imperialisms, which I think is, is really quite useful in this case. I don't think it means we should spend a huge amount of time debating the question of, is the Russian version of state capitalism equivalent to imperialism? Does it meet the various standards? I don't know, frankly, I'm not that interested these days in those theoretical debates. What I am clear about is that Russia is an aggressor. The US has been an aggressor for a much longer time. We have to deal with both of those realities. I think that the US imperialist project around the world uh, that we've seen over the last 20 years is diminished in certain ways militarily, but it is by far still dominant, especially militarily. It's even more uh, diminished economically and politically and diplomatically, but the military part is key. And that's where the US uh, domination remains strategically unchallenged. We do have to challenge the kind of anti-Russia, the Russia phobia, if you, if you will, that's going on in the US that has gone far beyond uh, a critique or even op opposition, which I think is, is appropriate to Russia's war in Ukraine to massive opposition to all things Russian, including Russian uh, pianists and Russian food, Russian restaurants had bricks thrown through the walls of their of their restaurants. You know, it's a uh, it's too easy to return to the Cold War ideological frame in which Russia was the long-standing villain of the United States back when it was in the Soviet Union, and it's very easy for the mass the vast majority of people in the U.S. to go back to that and think of Russia as aren't those the communists? Aren't those the bad guys? Isn't this the Soviet Union? It's like, actually, no, it's not. But 
you know, put that aside. We need to challenge that part while challenging a war. I would just say that I think there is a model to the challenges of this for, for us in how to analyze and how to mobilize around this. And this is in the context of the Syria war, where in my view, there were no good guys on, among the armed actors in the Syria war. In, when I was writing a book on, on the US war, the US uh, war against ISIS and what was going on in Syria, I talked about seven separate wars that were being fought at the time. Later, it was up to about 11. But in all of those situations, all of them were fighting to the last Syrian, just as now the US and Russia and everybody else are fighting to the last Ukrainian. The US destruction of Raqqa was going on at the exact same time as the Russian destruction of Aleppo. Both were war crimes, both were evil, both should have been opposed. Recognizing that US power is still dominant means that we have a huge amount of work to do. We have to recognize that we're holding both these realities, the two wars, as we, as we build this, we have to go beyond exposing the hypocrisy of how the war is being covered in mainstream media, how refugees are being treated, how elites are praising resistance to, uh, to the threats of sovereignty. You know, it was extraordinary seeing the BBC actually teaching people how to use Molotov cocktails to kill the, the, the massive, the, the most, uh, the highest number of Russians with each throw of a Molotov cocktail, how to get into the tank. So you kill as many Russian soldiers as possible. Compare that to the Israeli response when Palestinians announced that they were going to hold a nonviolent protest in Gaza on their own land. And the answer from the Israeli military was, we will answer that with sharpshooters. We will answer that with, with guns and we will shoot people dead. And they did. The sharpshooters were very good. They knew what they were doing and they killed 258 people in the context of challenging a nonviolent act of resistance. Compare that to how in the US and the UK and all across NATO, we're seeing the, this escalation. It's not surprising in the US, left, the right. State Department budget of $81 billion is one tenth the budget of the military. So if we look at budgets as moral documents, they are often immoral and they show the immorality of where priorities exist. The priorities of US foreign policy is military and the militarization of foreign policy remains. So we have right now a desperate need for moving towards negotiations. We have to go beyond the expose part, focus on pushing for, for diplomacy and not war. Top diplomats, as we heard earlier, across the United States, across the UK, across NATO are not supporting diplomacy. It's going to be up to our movements, the broad progressive movement, the left, all of us in challenging this notion that somehow the fact that a country like Ukraine has been invaded and occupied by another country means there is some right of self-defense. It does not mean supporting war and opposing a diplomatic solution that has to start with a ceasefire, has to start with a pullback of US and NATO troops, has to start with going back to pulling the nuclear weapons back. We are in an incredibly escalated moment of danger. This war, and I'll end with this, this war is far more dangerous globally than the global war on terror ever was. From the escalation to nuclear exchange possibilities, to the global food shortages that are, are already emerging from this war, to the expansion of military spending across NATO and indeed around the world. This war is having consequences far more global than the global war on terror, terror ever had. And it's up to us to stop it. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, um, and uh, you would be hearing a round of applause if we were in the room together. Um, you have, um, yeah, certainly highlighted the the global significance of the conflict um, uh, very, very sharply. And you'll see in the chat as well um, some solidarity being sent to you uh, for this and for um, women and comrades across America who um, it's a very difficult um, day today, um, and we are certainly with you and stand with you um, against that. So. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for showing up and being here and giving such an astute analysis um, of, of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, 
Okay, so um, next up we have Shabir Laka. Uh, Shabir is the editor of the Counterfire website. He is an activist with the People's Assembly and is also an officer of the Stop the War Coalition. Uh, Shabir. Thanks very much, Holly, and thanks everyone for coming here and thanks to Phillips, Phyllis and Alex for excellent contributions. Um, I wanted to start firstly by sending solidarity to the anti-war activists in Ukraine and Russia and across the world who today organized uh, as part of an international day of action against the war in Ukraine. Um, and I want to kind of start from, from where Phyllis left off, which is just, it's hard to overstate the dangerousness of the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, for the people of Ukraine, uh, this war has been and continues to be an absolute uh, horror show uh, with thousands of civilians killed, millions forced to flee and whole towns raised to the ground. Um, and as, as the others were saying, the war has developed into a, a, a deadly war of attrition, which shows no sign of, of ending anytime soon. And the dangers that this war presents are not only the continued misery of the Ukrainian people, which is, of course, profound, uh, but the tectonic shifts that are taking place in geopolitics and the massive drive towards more militarism and the devastating possibilities that that holds. Uh, since the war began, the number of NATO troops stationed around Eastern Europe has increased more than tenfold. Uh, billions worth of weapons have been pumped into the region uh, and our leaders are callously talking about nuclear warfare. Uh, and we already know that the US is planning to station nuclear weapons here in the UK at RAF Lake and Heath again. And the danger is that the, the longer that this war goes on, uh, the more likelihood there is of it expanding into other countries and other arenas and into even more uh, in even more detrimental ways. Um, and I want to focus mainly on what we as socialists in the West uh, should be doing in the face of this situation. And to do that, I just want to start with a couple of points. And the first is that without qualification, um, I think it's important to state that Putin's war in Ukraine is completely unjustifiable. And that the first thing that socialists and anti-war activists must be calling for is a, is a ceasefire and a withdrawal of Russian troops. Notwithstanding the role of NATO in leading up to this war, which I'll come to in a second, uh, Russia's war uh, of aggression in Ukraine is causing untold misery, as I've just said, for the people of Ukraine and has to be viewed in a similar vein uh, to the imperialist actions of the West uh, in their drive to secure greater spheres of influence and hegemony over the last uh, 70 odd years. Um, of course, as we know, uh, NATO is far from the defensive organization that is painted as by our leaders and in the mainstream. Uh, it's deliberate violations of the promises made to, to Russia to not expand into former uh, Warsaw Pact states. It's economic warfare against the Russian state, uh, carrying out military drills on the Russian border for years uh, and treating Ukraine as if it were a, mem a member of NATO have all paved the way uh, to this war. And, just to reiterate, in case Paul Mason is listening, uh, this is an explanation and not a justification. And far from being a Putin talking point, uh, to not mention the role of NATO in creating this crisis um, and, and uh, you know, and the ever more dangerous world that it has created would be to exonerate the West for its crimes of the past decades and the instability that it has caused in the pursuit of its imperialist ambitions. And it completely misguides what we as socialists must do to help uh, bring an end to this war. Right now, our government and the US government are actively undermining peace negotiations and are acting to prolong the war. On both of Boris Johnson's trip to Kiev, the headline was, don't bother negotiating with Russia. And that's just what was said in the open. We know that Zelensky quite early on uh, said that he was open to Ukrainian neutral neutrality in peace negotiations. And that was never mentioned again, undoubtedly after pressure from the West. Parts of the security, military and intelligence services and the mainstream media in the US are now openly calling uh, this a proxy war between the West and Russia uh, and are celebrating the fact that Russia's military is, is being weakened no matter how many Ukrainian lives are being lost in that pursuit. Uh, and this is the reality of what we're dealing with, an inter-imperialist rivalry in the face of uh, the collapsing unipolar world order. Um, and there is a correct and understandable instinct uh, from most people in response to the horrific scenes that we see in Ukraine that we must uh, do something. Um, and I think what we as socialists in the West have to get across and fight for is that that something that we have to do has to be to stop our government from exacerbating uh, this war. 
uh, more weapons, undermining negotiations aren't going to bring about an end to this war. And we need to point out the hypocrisy of our government in condemning Putin's actions when his actions are precisely what our government did to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Libya, to Syria and, and elsewhere. They claim to care about Ukrainian lives after the many millions that they have killed in those countries, uh, after a whistleblower exposed that the Home Office had a deliberate policy of granting refugee visas to all members of a Ukrainian family except one so that they could drive up the numbers that they claim to be helping knowing that they aren't actually going to come here. Uh, and when in our countries, uh, our Prime Minister reportedly called for the bodies to pile up high during COVID and had to be forced by a footballer to feed hungry school children. So we have to be clear as socialists that the question of war and imperialism is central to the struggles that we face at home. Uh, it is the same capitalist system that oppresses and exploits us that necessitates interstate competition and war. And really the government is helping us to make this case. It's why they attacked RMT strikers um, as Putin supporters, and by the way, full solidarity with the RMT for their brilliant strike action this week. Um, it's also it's why Boris Johnson has repeatedly tried to deflect from party gay, his by-election losses, his no confidence vote by talking up uh, the war in Ukraine and his supposedly Churchillian role in it. Um, it's why uh, the government is trying to pass legislation to limit our pos uh, ability to protest. Uh, and at the same time, the ability for strikers to effectively strike and why the police labeled anti-war groups along with climate and anti-racist groups as extremists. Uh, and it's why Keir Starmer has made it essentially an expellable offense for Labour MPs to support Stop the War. Uh, and also earlier this week, tried to ban shadow front bench MPs from visiting picket lines. So we, the, the foreign is an extension of the domestic and it has to be at the heart of what we do wherever there is war, it is the working people of those countries who bear the brunt of the war, who are killed and starved and forced to flee, who, who are drowning in the Mediterranean Sea because of Frontex or getting deported to Rwanda if they make it here. Uh, it is working people in the global south who are starving right now because of the food shortages caused by this war. It is working people who are facing rising costs over here and are being told that there's no money for higher wages or public services while they pump billions more into weapons of mass destruction. Um, and we were speaking to a Russian anti-war and socialist activist uh, uh, a couple of months ago, and, and he uh, told us that the highest anti-war sentiment in Russia was among the poorest sections of society. And I think that is the same true, the same here, sorry. Um, so I'll end just by saying that I think all of this should point us to the absolute uh, necessity of socialist organization and are trying to build working class internationalism that supports the Russian people who are standing up to Putin, that supports the strikers taking a stand against the government, and that can try to link these issues together and build collective and united resistance against the war and against the system that produces it and all its consequences. I'll end it there, thank you. Thank you so much, Shabir, for um, yeah that very passionate um, bringing together of the um, domestic and the foreign and uh, foreign policy issues, and um, yeah thinking about what it actually means for us as activists. Which um, this is what this festival is about: is bringing together Marxist ideas with Marxist action, so that we can um, take action in the world against uh, the injustices of which there are very, very many. Uh, so thank you so much, Shabir. Uh, we're going to go straight to our final speaker, um, who is Vijay Prashad. Uh, VJ is a Marxist historian and anti-imperialist. He is director of the Tri-Continental Institute for Social Research and the chief editor of Left Word Books. Um, VJ. Uh, thanks a lot, Holly. First, thanks to Counterfire for the festival. Uh, I saw Lindsay uh, in the room. So thanks to Stop the War and all the people in Britain trying to create some sort of sa sanity in your foreign policy. And I must say, thanks to the trade unionists for um, bringing a pulse uh, back onto those British Isles. And in my lifetime, I would really like to see Mick Lynch as your prime minister. So uh, make that happen, friends, make that happen. He's the only person in Britain who seems to be able to speak back to your wretched, wretched media, including that fellow Piers, whatever his name is, um, ridiculous excuse for people. They, 
they make my profession of journalism uh, a disgrace, honestly. Um, it's really great to be here. I'm, I'm going to make five points. They are reasonably related, and I hope they make sense to you. Um, the first point is on mood. There is a very different mood in the world uh, about the conflict in Ukraine than you will see in Europe, in Britain, or in North America. Very different mood. Um, Vladimir Zelensky spoke to the African Union uh, just on the 20th of June. There are 55 heads of government in the African Union, and only two showed up to listen to him. Uh, the rest simply didn't come. In fact, the head of the African Union and the head of the African Commission had just been in Sochi in Russia, where they were talking to um, Mr. Putin. They came back and said the sanctions have to end. Um, the Indian government, which is a wretchedly right-wing government, very much in a way subordinated to the United States, also is refusing to adopt the NATO position on the war, continuing to trade with Russia, continuing to speak of this conflict as a conflict imposed upon the Russians. Japan, a member of the Quad, has refused to break its investments in Sakhalin 1 and 2, uh, continuing to trade with Russia. Um, Mexico, I was in Mexico just a few days ago, went to meet the um, party Morena of uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Um, Andres Manuel himself has spoken saying, this is not our war, this is Europe's war, why should we have to line up and take a position on it? This is the mood in the world right now. I know that in Europe, you are fixated on this war, but people outside are saying it's your war. We have our own problems. You don't pay attention to our problems. Why should we believe that this is the most important conflict in the world? I would like to put that on the table for you to consider. Secondly, in my opinion, this is not just a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, nor between the United States and Russia and so on. This is a conflict about, I think, what is a process of historical inevitability. And that's the process I would call Eurasian integration. Since the world financial crisis of 2007, we've seen an increase in the integration of Europe with the rest of Asia, whether this is in buying energy from Russia, the energy buys from Russia, which is rational for Europe to be buying piped natural gas through Nord Stream 2, rather than buying liquefied natural gas from the United States or from the Gulf Arab states. The integration has come on the one side with the energy markets in Russia. And secondly, there's an integration with the Chinese technological breakthroughs and with Chinese high finance. Um, China has developed a large surplus. That's the reason why even a right-wing government in Poland joined the Belt and Road Initiative in 2019. The Italians, 12 or 14 Eastern European countries signed up to the Belt and Road. The process of Eurasian integration is inevitable, it's historic, it's a fact. The truth is that the United States government has tried to either delay, disrupt, or end this integration because this integration seriously threatens US dominion over Europe. There was a very interesting moment when Donald Trump sat with Jens Stoltenberg at a public meeting where they had cameras going. And Trump said something to Stoltenberg, I think which should be uh, listened to carefully. Trump said to Stoltenberg, look, you, you can't expect us, namely the United States, to protect you from Russia and continue to buy energy from the Russians, give them billions of, of euros and so on. That statement made by Trump is very significant because what he's essentially saying is, Euro Eurasian integration has to be ended. If you're going to continue to have the Atlantic integration, you can't have that and the Eurasian integration. It's the United States that's actually imposed a choice on Europe using its Trojan horse, which is NATO. It imposed the choice on Europe. It was the one that imposed that position in Germany while Angela Merkel was the chancellor over Nord Stream 2. It was the United States that said, do not um, license Nord Stream 2, do not certify it. It wasn't a, a full debate inside Europe. Of course, there were sections in Europe also opposed to Eurasian integration. What I'm trying to argue in this point is that Eurasian integration, and this is the second point, 
Eurasian integration is a historical fact. It's going to be very difficult to prevent this. I mean, look at what Germany has to substitute for Eurasian integration, a return to nuclear energy and strikingly a return to coal. This is Germany with the Greens as part of the government are uh, now talking about a return to coal. Look, I'm not saying that natural gas is a clean energy. It's not, it's also a fossil fuel, but it's far cleaner than coal and far less dangerous in, its, um, in the piped form than nuclear. And yet that's what this choice that the United States has imposed upon Europe is making Europe do. One, live with high prices. Secondly, move back to coal, move back to nuclear. Germany had pledged to get off nuclear. That's the third point, that the United States is attempting to end the historical process of Eurasian integration, again, either to end it or to delay it. But unfortunately, it doesn't have any instruments to do so. And here's the really dangerous thing. The United States is therefore willing to risk a catastrophic expansion of this war, not only in Ukraine, but also in the South China Sea precisely to break the historical fact of Eurasian integration. I don't buy this argument about Russian imperialism or Chinese colonialism. I think that's actually a red herring. The question here is the Chinese are simply not even being allowed to do normal capitalist commercial trade. When they tried to trade through one of their companies, Huawei in Europe, United States imposed a security uh, argument to say, stop buying Huawei they are going to spy on you. It's a ridiculous thing because after all, Edward Snowden has already proved that US tech companies are already spying on people. The United States was merely saying that Huawei might spy on you. It's a ridiculous standard that um, people like Boris Johnson were using when they said, you know, we're not going to use um, uh, Chinese technology and so on because it, it's dangerous to our security. I mean, the United States was spying on European leaders, including Angela Merkel herself while she was the chancellor. So the, the third point I'm making here is- the US is, Yes, exactly, almost done. US is imposing a war on Eurasia, not just in, in Ukraine, but also chillingly in the Arctic. Uh, I don't know if you followed this at all in the, in the Northern Sea route, but also in the South China Sea. The United States is imposing a war on Eurasia and we must oppose this. Final thing I want to say is that I'm also speaking on behalf of the International People's Assembly, which is a platform of 200 political movements that includes the landless workers movement in Brazil, the Socialist Party in Zambia, metal workers in South Africa and so on. I'd like you to come and take a look at our website. We are very much in favor of building a new internationalism we are very seized of this danger that the United States is posing, not only in the threats and in the information war that has become general, but here's the really chilling part. In talking again of nuclear primacy, it was the US government that left the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Missile Treaty in 2019, which actually provoked this conflict even more. If you want to know, when this conflict began, one of the origins of it is the day Donald Trump walked out of the INF Treaty. He walked out of that treaty unilaterally. He was not asked to walk out of that by any other country in the world. The US did that by itself. Let's not be, I think, confused about this and start talking about you know, multiple imperialisms and so on. I think that's not happening at all. The question here is a historical fact, the integration of Eurasia, is threatening to the United States and it is willing to use force, including nuclear force, to prevent that integration. Thanks a lot.